You are the master of the pun. The pun, yeah. You got to be careful. You can't force these things. They just have to happen. Some of them aren't good, as you know. <laughs> they just happen. They, right. Yeah. Hello and welcome to this edition of the Beautiful Work Podcast. I am your host, Dan Krikorian. Each episode, we feature a special guest from all walks of life, and we ask them to explore the ins and outs, the ups and downs, the trials, and the triumphs of their chosen field. Writers, musicians, coaches, business owners, athletes, and everything in between, we peel back the curtain to hear their stories, to walk their paths, to find out how they breathe life into their beautiful work. Well, it is exciting news. My new record, Grandeur, is officially available January the 18th. Whenever you are listening to this is the release date. Uh, This episode is coming out just a few days before the 18th, but you can go to iTunes right now and you can download the new album uh, and buy it and it'll show up bright and early on Friday morning the 18th in your iTunes. It has been a long four, four and a half years of creating and writing the album and rewriting and rewriting and rewriting and re-recording as... um, as albums tend to do, and I'm just, uh, I'm excited it's here, dankrikorian.com, you can go to to learn more about the album, as well as all the past Beautiful Work podcast shows, if you're just joining us for the first time. These next few episodes of the podcast are um, kind of a special, unique uh, part of it. Uh, I just got the chance to sit down with uh, five maybe six, depending on scheduling, if we can um, get another person in, but five to six episodes uh, with people that were heavily involved with making the record. So all the different musicians and engineers and people that uh, brought it to light. And uh, those are really fun. And I've had a blast getting to talk to everybody that's been involved and kind of dig into their careers a little bit. So those episodes are coming throughout the month of January and so we're kicking it off with someone that is very very important meaningful to my life and my career he has been there from the very beginning uh, Mike Teague and he is a fantastic singer songwriter guitarist and he has a career of his own now that he's um, doing his solo career and we got to talk about that And so he's kicking off this Beautiful Work podcast series that focuses a little bit around uh, the new record, Grandeur. So uh, we will get to Mike in just a second. For those that are just joining us or have been following along, thank you so much. Um, Always just amazed at the, I don't know, I don't know how people find the podcast, um, but you guys are and more and more joining each episode and there's a community building around it and I appreciate people reaching out with kind words and I'm glad you're enjoying the episodes um, doing the best work I can to bring you quality stuff and most of that just comes on the backs of the great people I've interviewed and their just great lives and how hard they work and so I'm just excited to be a part of it so if you are interested more dankercorian.com you can also um, find beautiful work podcasts on spotify and itunes and if you're so inclined please feel free to rate it and leave a comment that helps people or more people find it on itunes so that is enough about that mike teague came over to my studio and he brought some homemade beer and we sat down and talked about his life in music and beyond and it was Uh, A lot of fun to do it and to talk with uh, an old friend about all that he is up to and has done. So, without further ado, let's get to the show. (laughs) 
Mike Teague was born in Memphis, Tennessee, and his father, Will Teague, is one of the earlier members of the band, the New Christie Minstrels. At an early age, Mike was surrounded and influenced by great music and picked up and began playing guitar in his early teen years. He was heavily influenced by artists like Dan Fogelberg, David Wilcox, Amy Grant, Rich Mullins, Joni Mitchell, and most notably, the great James Taylor. For years, while working as an animal control officer in Southern California, Mike sang and played guitar in various bands, including, and still my own, and always found a deep love of writing songs. After retiring, Mike released his first solo record, Waterfall, in September of 2017. Recorded at the Songwriter Studio in Knoxville, Tennessee, the album features beautifully written and produced songs in the folk, Americana, and songwriting vein. Mike's finger-picking style shines through on the album, as does his knack for storytelling and creating hooky and melodic verses and choruses. The release and his frequent playing has garnered him a growing and loyal following in Southern California as he writes and plans his next steps in his career. Mike is here today to share with us his new life in music, his fantastic sense of humor, and that time in his life when he worked as a mortician. All right, I am joined now live in uh, in the studio by Mike Teague. Mike, thanks for joining the Beautiful Work Podcast. You're welcome. Before we start, I think it's fair to say um, I'm drinking right now with you a homemade coconut porter. Yeah. And uh, this is delicious. So cheers. Yeah, cheers. Yeah, cheers. To- yeah, it's pretty good. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The first... Um, episode that I've been able to have a beer and drink with the guests. Yeah. Well, you know, just have me over more often. <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> you won't have an audience after a while, but. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, we're going to get to a lot of music, but let's start with, do you have a nickname that people don't know about? I, you know, when I was a kid, uh, I was called Moose. You were called Moose? Yeah. Do you know one of my best friends? was called Moose as well. Oh, wow. Rob Selway, that was in my wedding. Oh, yeah. Wow. Why, why were you called Moose? Uh, I don't know. I guess I was a stocky little kid. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> who, my ears are not quite that big. So who, who gave you that nickname? Uh, my my mom or dad or somebody like that. Okay. Yeah, I don't remember. And then why didn't it, why haven't we heard that? You just kind of buried it or it just didn't uh, catch I on? I things, yeah, hidden from... <laughs> Many things hidden from people, so that was one of them. Well, now that it's on the podcast, it's uh, <laughs> it's out there. <laughs> it's out there. Yeah. Um, I like that nickname, Moose. Yeah. I mean, maybe you didn't like it, but I, I didn't have any problem. I'd like uh, you know, large deer are great. <laughs> <laughs> well, good. I, I like uh, Moose. I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to bring that up at some point during band <laughs> practice. I like it. Yeah. So. You grew up in the South. Um, actually, I grew up mostly here in Southern well, you're, California, but I'm from Memphis. You're from Memphis. Yeah, born how, in Memphis. How long were you in Memphis? Well, uh, lived there until about age four or so and uh, moved to uh, Hialeah, Florida for a, about a year. Okay. And because uh, my, my dad was doing uh, music. Right. He had gotten a gig down there. So 
Um, so I lived down there and then we ended up coming out to California in 65. It seems like the South features uh, prominently in a lot of your writing. Is there like a nostalgia that you feel for the South from, I don't know, being there as a, as a child or when you go back and visit? Or I mean, you have songs about Charleston and things like that. Yeah, well, Charleston was just from visiting Charleston. That was okay. just, and that's South Carolina. Um, but yeah, I've got, you know, some songs just, just yeah, the South is just so cool. Yeah. Um, great people. And uh, the food, of course, is phenomenal. But uh, just, a, it's just a, a whole different feel down there. You know, people are just loving giving folks you know i know you always tell me we gotta do a trip we do to the south we need to get down there yeah yeah well maybe after this record we can uh we can swing on down and do a little southern thing yeah yeah well so the other reason i bring up the south is because was it two years or three years ago now when you went to record your album it was actually in april of 2017 last year so so it was that uh, I feel like we've been talking about this album forever, so yeah. it was just a, just a, a year ago. Yeah, yeah, it's just uh, <laughs> yeah, it does seem like it's been a while. But yeah, went out to Knoxville and uh, recorded uh, recorded the album Waterfall. Uh, great place called Songwriter Studio. Uh, the guy there, uh, William Sandy Garrett, uh-huh. and uh, down in Knoxville, just north of Knoxville. And just a great location, uh, old house that he had, and uh, he had some great musicians on there. Um, so Gideon Klein and Adam Whipple and uh, Michael Craw, Daddy Crawley, fantastic. That's a nickname. Harmonica guy. Oh my goodness, that guy can play. They all can play. They're all just fantastic. And why did you choose Knoxville to go record this album? Truthfully, um, because you know, I'm sure you want to lie, but uh, truthfully, <laughs> I, I just didn't want to drive to LA every day. So, you, so, I, so, so <laughs> you said, I'll so drive one I'm, time. I'm driving to Knoxville, just one straight shot down I 40. <laughs> so, also, you know, being back in Tennessee, my, you know, uh, birth state you know uh it's just nice back there and i got a chance to stay with some great friends um a guy i used to work with he and his wife at this little farm called the rowdy dogs farm in uh dandridge okay and uh they've got you know these three aussie shepherds and now they've That's got kind of dog i got yeah good dogs yeah good dogs and they've got a donkey jackpot and they've got shorty the very short horse and sheep and cows now. And it's, <laughs> it's a really fun place. I helped them put their garden together uh, that year. And that was really, it was fun. It was a good time. So it was good. To, and it also, it just gave me time to focus, really get it done. And, and I didn't have any distractions. Did the record change at all from the time you left to the time you got to Knoxville and began recording it? Like, that, that time of driving, you know, by yourself or stopping and seeing different parts of the country. And I'm assuming you're thinking about the songs and what's going into them. Did anything change from beginning to when you eventually got there? No. Uh, you know what? I pretty much was just going to go and just see what happened. And uh, and uh, I think it came out pretty good. You know, and I. It's fantastic. I, yeah. I'm, you know, I think it's a. Uh, you know, for a first CD, I thought it did pretty good. <laughs> it's, it's really, it's really good. Well, let's come back to that album in just a little bit because um, I want to get more into it in your songwriting. Um, but let's talk about early on with you. And you mentioned at the top of the show that you know, born in Memphis, moved to Florida for a little bit because your dad mm-hmm. um, got a gig. Could you maybe explain what that gig was? I know he he did a lot of music. Right, he was. Uh a singer in Memphis. Um, he used to do morning shows and whatnot. His father was the uh, editor for the Commercial Appeal, which was a big newspaper in the South. And uh, he, uh, my dad had, you know, as starting as a little kid, started singing. 
and uh, continue doing that and uh, got a gig in Florida. And uh, my mom recently told me that he, it didn't pan out. So he ended up playing in a couple of places, uh, the Flick and a couple of places in, in Miami area. And then he got a gig with the, uh, had an opportunity to try out for the new Christie Minstrels, which was a pretty prominent folk group in mm-hmm. the 60s started by Randy Sparks and he got the gig with the, the Christie's in 65 and played with them for uh, I think it was 18 months or something like that did several albums with them so were you old enough to remember being around any of those shows I mean how old were you at that point uh, you know five six okay um, I could i I was just talking to somebody the other day. I remember going to CBS Studios, and it's probably 66 or something like that. And I think the Christies were playing, and the Nitty Gritty Dirt Band happened to be there. And I remember them being there. It was just in the, in the, you know, we were, I don't, couldn't tell you who was there. Okay. But, you know, I, <laughs> I just remember the Nitty Gritty Dirt Band and, and all that. And uh, it was, you know, it's kind of a, some little bit of memory there. Was, yeah. You know, watching him play, being in Detroit, I think. I remember taking a train back as a kid from Detroit to San Diego and the Super Chief for all mm-hmm. you train buffs out there. And, uh, yeah, it's you know, trying to remember some of it. But, yeah. The style of music that your dad played and your kid, Christy Mitchells did, um, it seems like you still have... Um, like when you write, I wouldn't say it's the, it's some, that similar to it, but like it's in the same vein. Has that just been a, a type of music that's stuck with you? Yeah. I mean, I've got so many influences anyway. Yeah. Um, but, you know, that being in my life, yeah, uh, there was so much music, you know, that style and then jazz and classical and, you know, I remember when I got the the first Beatles album. You know, the mm-hmm. my dad came home with Revolver, and you know that was a huge influence. So I mean, it was you know, there's lots of influences there. Right now, for for those that are listening, you know, last year you put out your first record, mm-hmm. and uh, I know you've got plans for more. Mm-hmm. But in the middle part of your life, like talk about what you've done along with music. You've played for me. For me, with me, excuse me. Yeah, for the for life. you. Yeah, <laughs> now because we don't get paid. Yeah, <laughs> play this. <laughs> but you played with me for it, it's almost ten years. Ten years. Yeah. Um, and but when I met you, and up until last year, hmm. Animal Control in Newport yeah. Beach, yes. and then Animal Control Officer for Newport Beach for twenty four years, and uh, you know, got my kids through school and. House payments, you know, need to make a living and, you know, can't make a living as a, as a musician, <laughs> a songwriter. Well, it, maybe if you try a little bit, but, uh, yeah, I, no, it was important that I, you know, be around family wise. So I, I felt like you did, you did enjoy being animal control oh, officer yeah. all those years, you know, no, it was, it was fun. You know, yeah. I mean, what, I mean, who doesn't enjoy driving on the beach? That's right. And, uh, you know, and Newport's a beautiful town. It's, you know, it's got some, it's got some very nice people there. So it was nice to help people out and help their animals and help whatever. How did you get into that? Um, when I got out of high school, my, one of my first jobs in as college, um, I was a, a vet veterinary assistant over at Stanton Pet Hospital. Okay. In Stanton here in Southern California mm-hmm. and, um, did that for a bit and then, you know, had some other things going on. Did you know? Got married and you know, moved to Escondido and worked my father-in-law for a while. But then uh, when we came back, I needed to get another job. When we came back down to uh, came back up to Orange County, and uh, so I was comfortable with that. There was a job available at uh, Irvine Veterinary Services, so I worked for them for a bit, and then got a job as an emergency animal control emergency. What was it? Orange County Emergency Animal Clinic. Yeah. Over there by the airport. Orange okay. County. Yeah. So, yeah, just did that. And then finally got a job, passed the test and 
I said, okay, Mike, we'll give you a job. <laughs> so. Well, it is kind of a perfect job for you because I know how much you love listening to music. Oh, yeah, it's great. Get out there, listen to music. Yeah. And, uh, and of course, the radio trying to give me calls, of course. <laughs> right, always bugging mm-hmm. you with work. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, yeah, no, it was, it was great. It was nice. Also, just a job for you because you just enjoy talking to people. And uh, I think we've, well, we've met some musicians that have been in the band from your work. Yep. I'm, yeah. You're driving up and down the beach. And yeah. <laughs> met one of our you know, piano guys. <laughs> right. <at> piano. <laughs> and uh, yeah, sitting on the beach. Hey, how you doing? What's going on? I mean, he's playing guitar. And sure enough. <laughs> yeah. You want to be in a band? <laughs> he was in the band next week for a while. <laughs> yep. And a fantastic player too. Yep. Yeah. Um. And I think you, you touched over a little bit, but I think it's really interesting part of another job you had. You were a mortician <laughs> yes, for a while. I was a mortician. I went to mortuary school and uh, got my uh, certificate in mortuary science and uh, worked at a mortuary in San Pedro for about a year and decided... You know, I think I need to do something <laughs> different. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, take me back. What was it about? Like, why did you like <laughs> the decision? The decision to go into school. It's just fat. We haven't talked about this a whole lot. No, um, I was working at Stanton Pet Hospital and, okay. and helping the uh, vet tech do uh-huh. some treatments and and you know doing that every day. And it, it you know it's it you know after a while it gets it's noisy and you know it gets kind of tiring after a bit so the vet tech says she says you know if i had a chance to do it over again i think i'd be a you know be a mortician cuz it's so quiet <laughs> i thought oh huh that's interesting but i also like the science aspect of it cuz i I've, I've thought doing that maybe going into forensics or something cuz i okay. i've been kind of fascinated with that so i'm glad i did it it was uh it was an eye opener and uh, it actually just made me really appreciate life more so. Yeah, that was yeah. going to be my question. Like, yeah. what did you take f- from that? Yeah, life is short. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's really important to, to live it. Yeah. So. Did, like, I'm just really interested in that part of your life. <laughs> I don't know why. I'll, but because we haven't talked. You and I have been on the road together for yeah. a lot of hours. And we haven't talked too much about. Well, not a lot of people want to. You know, it's true. sit around and talk. Yeah, that's, that's true. Probably not too exciting for people. Well, yeah. Um, so you, you transferred out of that. Got out of that. You, your songs aren't. Uh, you haven't had a song that's gone back and revisited There's that. Nothing. No, not really. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I dig you, baby. No. Yes. <laughs> they're, yeah, well, they're good. Good. Yeah, I'm glad you yeah. finally got to it. <laughs> I, 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 my next point was going to be. So I've spent. I've spent more time on the road traveling with you than any any person. Um, and after seven, <laughs> eight, nine, it, right? <laughs> lucky you, yeah. lucky us, yes. <laughs> but after uh, five, six, seven, eight, nine, uh, ten days on the road together and multiple hours, um, yeah. the Good. sense the sense of humor and really getting to know somebody comes out. And you are the master of the pun. The pun, yeah. And where? Where and why? Where and why? <laughs> well, uh, that would probably come from my father, okay. uh, who was, uh, you know, one of these guys that words were important. So, but he would try to make, you know, funny things and mm-hmm. some of them weren't successful. So I always try to be a little more successful. You know, you try to do better than your, your parents and father. So that was the idea. So okay. I, I thought maybe I improved on that over the years. In so the puns. I think I did. I don't know. You know, you're so. pretty punny. I'm a punny dude. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it's it's heavy handed in the band. Well, it's it's subtle because I don't. Well, I mean, you don't. Yeah, you don't. You know, you, you got to be careful. You can't force these things. They just have to happen. <laughs> Some of them aren't good, as you know. <laughs> they just happen. They, right. Yeah. 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 On that same note, you and I, I, I don't know if I've laughed ever as much. Um after about eight or nine hours in the car together yeah. getting to Seattle and yeah. having a, a sip of, a couple of sips of brandy. Yeah, we had some brandy. It was at, what is it? it was a Moldovian, Moldovian brandy, brandy. Just a sip, you know, and, and, and but we were so tired. We were punchy. S- punchy. And yeah. uh and we were we were staying at Gellies. Right. Right. Hi Gelly. 
you're listening. Yes, hello. And uh, and we just well, we're we're changing uh, words uh, words to Bob Dylan songs yeah. and uh, yeah, you did something. I, I did if yeah. I, you know if you're traveling with an old traveling. with an old country bear, an old country bear, <laughs> and it's the stupidest <laughs> thing. But at that time, <laughs> it was really we, funny. We lost it. Yeah, <laughs> we yeah. lost it. Well, you know, and then we, obviously we had some other fun down in Oregon. There was, you know, that, yes, that was pretty yes. funny too. Yeah, that was. But well, well, I, well I've enjoyed the travels, and yeah. um, you know, as my career has has grown, you know, you saw me play at this uh, little coffee shop, ten. 11, 12 years ago now. Mm-hmm. And I don't know what you saw in me, but afterwards you wanted to get together and play. And then you introduced me to Randy, who's been our bass player mm-hmm. for 10 years. And then uh, it's just kind of grown. I think more than anybody, you've seen you've seen kind of the behind the scenes workings of, uh, you know, this is coming out my fifth album and kind of all of them you've, except maybe the first one, You've been around and I, I appreciate it because you're someone I heavily lean on just with your your background and you have just such a good sense of, of music. And um, so on this record, on a few songs, you sing background vocals uh, as you do in, in the band. And But it's much more than that. You know, I, I don't know what the credit would be on the bottom of the album for someone that's just like around me all the time while these songs are being <laughs> written and helping me with all the rough drafts and X's out, you know, and things like that. But um, but I really appreciate it. Well, it, you know, it's it's fun to to have watched your growth over the last 10 years, you know, your your songwriting abilities and just uh, what your what you've got going and what you what's coming. Well, thank you. Yeah. I, I appreciate that. Um, you know, a lot of the people that we talk to on this podcast, they have like an inner circle of people that they just lean really heavily on, um, in their career and, um, you and, you know, the rest of the guys in the band have, have been someone and I'm, and I want to get back to you, um, because what I think has been fun for me is I know when we first met, um, you know, you've, you've, you have and still do play in um, some cover bands that are a lot of fun. Whiskey Tango. Whiskey Tango, shout well, out. Yeah, Huntington Beach. Yeah, there's because I think there's like 27,000 Whiskey Tango bands throughout the United <laughs> States. And uh, we are the Whiskey Tango Huntington Beach version. So uh, the best version. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's by far. Yeah. The, yeah. We, we can do. Uh, uh, yeah, we can do Free Bird with the best of them. Yeah. You guys are good. I've been I've been to plenty of whiskey tango shows, and it's a different side of you that uh, I like to see. Yeah, it's a little heavy on the rock side. Yeah, I can't sing for three days afterwards, <laughs> but I have a good time. Um, but so now, though, um, I know you had talked about it for years, but you retired last year. Uh, or retired, year, actually, it's been three years. I okay. retired in Man. December fifteenth. December fifth. Yeah, of 15th. December. Okay. Yeah. And then I know for a long time, though, you had talked about wanting to do a record and wanting to start to, you know, have your your solo stuff and play shows. And so, you know, it's fun, fun for me because obviously I love having you around with with my stuff um, and you've been able to do both. But tell me what it's like starting to step out and kind of be your own musician now at this point after you've um, retired. Hmm. Well, you know, it's. It's fun for one thing, um, you know, and of course, you know, I love playing with you and there's, you know, that's just a different side, but you know, we're a little different in our styles. Yeah. And so, you know, I can, you know, basically I just kind of do my thing. Yeah. And, uh, you know, when I'm playing with you, I'm, I'm to help out to help you, uh, sound as best as you can with the minimum amount of, uh, mistakes. Right. <laughs> or receive. Uh, yeah. Receive the, Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, but, uh, yeah, no, getting out and, and, you know, it's kind of one of those things, you know how it is, you know, you're, there's that nervousness of getting out, playing in front of you all by yourself. And there's that vulnerability when you're out there playing by yourself. When when it first started, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of like, oh man, this is like, what am I doing? Why am I? Yeah. No, that's, yeah. That's a, I don't know if people think about how difficult that is, like, like when you go to a show and you see a band on stage, but that's one thing. But then when you go see someone 
that's by themselves. Mm -hmm. I, I just always have so much respect, no matter how good or bad they are. You know, you go to some place and somebody's, you know, yeah, it, they're starting out. Yeah. And then, or if you go someplace and someone's just killing it, gosh, it's hard to get up there by yourself. Yeah. Even, you know, I've been doing it for 10 years. You've been getting up on stages all your life. There's something kind of funky about yeah. getting in front of people and saying like, this is, these are my songs. You know, it's kind of a personal thing. Right. Right. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's the thing. It, and getting the nerve to sing the songs in front of people, uh, uh, bringing out your, you know, inner feelings. Yeah. And, you know, some people are maybe right that are a little more, maybe not as heavy in their thinking. It's just kind of, you know, everything sunshine. Yeah. Grass is green, you know, okay. Well, that's, <laughs> that's great. But you know, when you start getting into some of the heavier stuff, you know, some of these writers and, you know, like some of the writers that you really enjoy or work, you know, like the, you know, James Taylor stuff that I yeah love and are just, just about everybody does. But, uh, you know, it's, um, it's just great getting out and playing it, you know, being the age I am, it's, I don't know that there's age discrimination, but it is harder when you're a little bit older <laughs> to kind of get things going. I figure, uh -huh. okay, well, I'm going to start a little bit late, but you know, better late than never. Might as well. I don't know if age discrimination as much as just, um, I, you know, it's funny. I even feel it now being in my early thirties, like, Ooh, oh yeah. But you're not the same like young twenty, no. you know, guy with the guitar. It's just like now you're feeling like you can't do some of that stuff anymore. And I would, you know, imagine for you being a step ahead of me. Yeah, and I think you know. Also, though, I look at it kind of um, if I can get up there, maybe I can inspire maybe somebody younger. Yeah, get up there and say, well, "Hey, well, that old fart can do it. I can do it." <laughs> So, yeah. Well, I've noticed about you too is, um, you know, from from just working with myself, then also now like when you go out and you play these showcases or shows, whatever it is that you're playing, you tend to reach out to musicians, young and old, and to, to work with them or to try to write together. Is that something that, you know, it's kind of a business decision like, hey, I want to work with a lot of people or... And I think I know the answer. Just genuinely, you're just kind of always like, I'm just interested in people. I just like hanging out with, you know, especially other musicians and yeah. and what. I just like it's it's some you know nowadays. Unfortunately, you got to be careful. Uh, but um, you know, having somebody a little bit older coming up to somebody a little bit younger, going, "Hey, you want to co-write?" And, and it's like, right? Oh, uh, I don't think uh, I think you're my dad. Aren't you? Uh, <laughs> right. No. So, uh, yeah. yeah. So, you know, and my intention is just, hey, I just, you know, you've got some, you know, I see some talent in that person. Yeah. And I would like to, you know, uh, maybe bring something I've learned or also especially learned from some of the, some of the talent is, gosh, it's just amazing. I want to learn yeah. something from them. And, uh, you know, I don't know how to read music. I don't, you know, I don't know all the theory. I don't know anything like that. Which is interesting play. to me because you're such a talented musician, but you, you always say that like when we're in band practice, you know, and we've got at any point two to three guys in the band, sometimes four hmm. that are, um, like trained musicians right. you know, went to school, have all the theory and you and I are not, I I've tried really hard to learn it you're, you're way ahead of me as far as knowing you know. but it's funny because you say that but then you, but your ear and your feel and just your instincts are probably the correct yeah theory yeah. <laughs> whatever the theory is like you know it you just don't always i guess have the definition of something well i think you you know you talk to people that say you know i've been classically trained but I can't improvise. Yeah. They can't do anything unless they've got something in front of them. Mm -hmm. And then you got somebody like myself who, you know, look at a sheet and say, what are those dots on there? You know? <laughs> right. And, uh, right. Um, so I think there's, you know, and there's those that, that do both, you know, they, those are the ones that can, uh, I would like to have a little bit more of that, but yeah. you know, I, God gave me what I did and I'm, I'm using it. So, you know, just take what I got. Well, and what you got is a lot because you're one of the best finger pickers that I've, I've been around. Um, oh, well, that's, and, and that's, yeah, I think people that listen to your music, I, I think that's a big part of 
how you songwrite and it's also part of like your live performance is um is so good by yourself because your guitar work is so good where did that come from you know i think that was just uh obviously i've said before james taylor big influence Mm -hmm. um and and his style is very finger pickery kind of guy yeah if that's a word pickery um (laughs) but uh, you know if you're playing by yourself you want to fill as much as you can as much where the you know you don't have a band yeah um something that's interesting to people's ears and you know just strumming all the time is great but there's there's just something about a nice finger pick you know james taylor david wilcox and stuff like that i mean just just you know just to make it interesting yeah so your style is that just years of you practicing your own way or are you trying to learn those songs by heart or how did you do that well i think well my first book uh one of my first books that i learned how to play because i started playing when i was about 15 and a half 16 mm-hmm. and uh like i said I, james taylor was a big book so i got one of his books now he has like 300 chords on each song right. and so you got to learn a bunch of you know core i mean i was so happy when i learned how to play uh don't let me be lonely tonight because there, there's you know like wow there's like a lot of chords so i was very excited right uh-huh. and now it's you know it's like uh secret of life which just got a bunch you know some cool chords in there and and uh so i try not to go too crazy you know it's like that the joke about the the rock band and the jazz band the difference between the two right oh yeah i love that joke but let's let's let should we say that i joke? think we should okay well you know the difference between that is the the rock band plays three chords in front of 10,000 people and the jazz band plays 10,000 chords in front of three people. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Sorry, jazzies. I, uh, I, I love jazz. Uh, <laughs> in 2008, I was playing one of my first concerts at a small coffee shop in Orange, California called The Ugly Mug Cafe. I was playing to a modest crowd filled with family and friends, and I still remember the nerves, the rush, the energy of singing my own songs to a room full of people. For someone As shy and private as myself, this was, and still is, a difficult thing to do. But as I was slogging through my earliest breakup songs and telling jokes on stage, someone I had never met before, a friend of a family member, was sitting in the audience. That was Mike Teague. You never really know when and who will change the course of your life. These things just can't be planned. But after meeting Mike that night and the friendship we forged, my path was altered for the better. Not only did Mike help build my current band and introduce me to some of the best musicians around, but he was one of the first people to truly believe in what I was doing and has been a mentor both on and off the stage. He has championed my music and taught me to respect the craft of writing. I hope everyone is so lucky to have a Mike Teague in their corner. Now, after years behind the scenes, Mike has stepped out front and is carving a career of his own. Mike and I have had lengthy discussions and talked some on this podcast about how difficult and scary it is to actually put yourself, your work, your art out in front of people to judge, to love, hate, or be indifferent about. It's a gigantic daily hurdle to jump and one that I know Mike is glad that he has. And I'm forever grateful he's always pushed me to do so in mine. In Stephen Pressfield's fantastic book, 
The War of Art. He discusses this creative fight like this. The more scared we are of a work or a calling, the more sure we can be that we have to do it. We fear discovering that we are more than we think we are, more than our parents, children, teachers think we are. We fear that we actually possess the talent that our still, small voice tells us, that we actually have the guts, the perseverance, the capacity. We fear we truly can steer our ship, plant our flag, reach our promised land. What does your songwriting process look like? <laughs> well, it, it's pretty much um, I get I start playing, just grabbing the guitar and just start playing and then I'll pick away and then something will pop up. And I usually get the uh, the chords and whatnot and I start doing a, a melody, singing gibberish as most songwriters do. Yeah. The gibberish songs. And uh, just work on a, a melody through that and then just start getting words to kind of fit with the melody. How do you know when you're like on to something? Is it a feeling that you get from the song or is it a lyric that comes out of nowhere? Like when do you know, okay, I'm going to continue to go down this path of this song? Sometimes it's either one or both. I mean, you know, all of a sudden, you know, I'll, I'll have a tune and it'll be, I mean, I've had tunes like for, for two years where it had nothing. Mm -hmm. I and mean, there was nothing. In fact, uh, uh, I had a, a song this last album that uh, I had the music to for I don't know how long. And uh, the guy named David Starr mm -hmm. uh, lives in Colorado. Good, real good songwriter as well. Met him at the uh, Kauai Songwriter Festival. And... Um, I asked him, hey, you know, uh, I met him at the, the second time. I, first year I met him, um, we didn't get together, but the second time we did. And I, would you like to co-write? Because I've got this tune and I've got nothing. And uh, it's called That Full Moon, right? Mm -hmm. So I didn't have anything. And then like the week before I go out to Hawaii, um, just, you know, when that full moon rises, all your kindness runs away. And I thought, okay, okay, there we go. Okay, we can do that. Do that first line. And then from there, you know, David had some great ideas uh -huh. and uh, came out with a fun song. And, and that made the record. That It was fun, yeah. yeah. It made the record. It was fun. And But, you know, you just never know. Sometimes, I mean, as you know, sometimes the song will come out in 15 minutes. Yep. And then other times it just takes forever. But I'm kind of a, I'm a slow writer in a sense that I don't write too many notes. Like a lot of people write notes. Mm -hmm. I stare at a page until <laughs> I, I get it in my head. I'm going through verses and things in my head and then, oh, that'll fit. Okay. So I'll make that work and hopefully it makes sense. So yours, you, yeah, you have a, a neater. Um, it's like a very neat page. Yeah. Yeah. It's not very messy. I remember. And uh, I think really it helped. When I went to the Kauai Songwriter Festival, there was a um, one of the teachers there, Jason Bloom, uh -huh. a very, very, very successful songwriter. And um, he critiqued songs. Well, and he critiqued, he's critiqued a couple of mine since I've been there a couple of times. And he really got me to think, um, you know, the songs really got to make sense yeah. to people. And, you know, it's got to flow. And, you know, so, I mean, he's had me... Uh, think rethinking how to do song or, and uh, really, really very helpful. I highly recommend taking one of his classes or something, but um, anyway, or one of his books. I, I yeah. have a hard time keeping my notebooks neat. Yeah. Like my, it, I'm probably, I mean, you see, I've got some sitting over there. It's just like all over a crazy man. 
Yeah. See, I guess I'm uh, Ev- OCD or <laughs> <laughs> Well, so eventually, like I have these pages that you could tell are just like the beginnings of songs and it's just like, you know, a word or a lyric or, and then eventually kind of paring down to what will be a song. But um, yeah, I applaud you for that because like, I mean, just even my board behind us right now in the studio of just yeah. like people to interview for this podcast. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, you're a lot it's, more organized than I am. I don't know. It looks sort of beautiful I'm, mindish. I, I'm amazed <laughs> at, you know, at your age how much, you know, you've got it together. You know, even uh, when we first met 10 years ago and it's like, man, this guy's got it together. I wish I had that like kind of <laughs> chutzpah when I was his age. <laughs> well, thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, talk about your love of vanilla ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> which I'm pretty much off of for the last couple of weeks. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, there's just something about vanilla ice cream, man, especially soft serve. But yeah, uh, every stop on tour, every stop, soft serve. Come. Yeah, and it, sometimes it was in the morning, sometimes morning, sometimes, you know, I'm, I'm not, you know, any time of the day is good for me. But you also put, you also told me to put orange juice. It, right. If you get it, you know, from the, from the box, you know, out of the, in the freezer. Yeah. I put orange juice on my ice cream. Usually. Okay. Yeah. And vanilla ice cream. So that's just, you developed or your family, somebody I, liked I it? I don't know. It's just, I liked it. My mom used to, uh, well, she I mean, still does, I think, but, uh, she likes to put milk on her ice cream. Okay. Vanilla ice cream. And so it gives these little chunks, you know, with the orange, it gives you like these little chunks. It's kind of like a 50, 50 bar in a sense. Okay. Like orange Julius. Yeah, you keep telling me about it. Um, it's I, actually pretty good on chocolate ice cream as well. Really? Orange juice on chocolate. It's kind of like, you remember those chocolate oranges that we get during Christmas? Mm-hmm. Okay, you know? Yeah. That's what it kind of tastes like, a chocolate orange. Hmm. Okay. But I keep, I avoid the chocolate stuff, so. Okay. Yeah. Well, your coconut porter beer that you brought is uh, It's, you know, it's pretty good. Yeah, my stepdad, uh, Tom Young, does, uh, he and I, we just have fun. We make a batch, you know, a couple of times a year and just have it around we can give it to friends and that kind of stuff so it's really good we should bring it and sell it at shows you should make we could <laughs> can you do I that know i might probably make more money at selling beer than i would in my music well i think <laughs> i think most businesses <laughs> make more money selling beer than anything else <laughs> exactly um yeah i i, I want to make whiskey someday <laughs> you go right ahead <laughs> I, I swear <laughs> no, I talk, i've talked with my wife about this someday i want to um, I don't know. Make uh, do a small batch of something of uh of whiskey because I just wow. enjoy like the art of how long it takes to go into it yeah. and whatnot. But I don't yeah. know. Yeah. Well, I don't whiskey and I don't get along, so I, I'm not <laughs> touching that stuff. Uh, um, next steps in your career. Hmm. The next year or two, what's on the table? What are you working on? What do you want to do? What's happening next? Well, you know, continue writing um, and and just try to get some more gigs, you know, house concerts, whatever, open for somebody, you know, like I said, it's uh, just a matter of me reaching out and calling places and yeah. emailing and, yeah, put me on. Are you still going to play with me when you can? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I know we got our nice gig and uh, coming up in Orange County, yeah, Orange County Fair, yeah, yeah. So yeah, working on the uh, working on the summer stuff right yeah. now. Yeah, so looking forward to that. Yeah. Um, how about album songwriting? I know you're co-writing with a lot of people. Yeah, here and there, I can't co-write here and there. Um, yeah, I've got some songs. Uh, well, I've got quite a few. Just kind of figure out where I want to go because I've got some that are uh, more on the spiritual side, more on the church side, and uh, mm-hmm. just thinking about maybe doing something like that as well. So, um, uh, you know, there's some EPs or something like that. Yeah, and, you, know, you know, kind of see how that goes. What's since you've be, you've retired mm-hmm. and started doing a solo career? What's a typical day look like now? <laughs> <laughs> I get up. <laughs> you know, I tell you, I, I do two to three crossword puzzles a day. Okay. And, uh, you know, a Sudoku, Sudoku at least. <laughs> and, uh, you know, get my, get my brain going, put on classical music. I listen to classical music all the time. So uh, I like to, in the morning, 
you know, get my uh, turmeric ginger tea with a little honey, my oatmeal, mm-hmm. get my crosswords, put on my, you know, put on KUSC, listen to classical music. And then, you know, about 11 o'clock, uh, I can get up and, uh, you know, if I got some stuff around the house, but, you know, get out there and get out in the garage and, and start playing. And are you writing every day right now? Uh, as some- much as I can. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I try to write something every day. You said, uh, like I mentioned our, prior to this, you know, I've got you know three or four songs I'm working on at the moment, and you know, just did a, a co-write with a friend, and uh, they just, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's one of those things. You know, when when you retired, that's what you do. <laughs> so well, I, yeah, I'm a, I'm a looking couple forward to that. Couple steps behind You're you, a few uh, steps behind, yeah, um, but. Hopefully I'll be there for your retirement. Yeah. Yes. Be pretty old though. <laughs> um, what's the difference between working as a solo artist as opposed to when you're working with me in our band, in the full band? Well, working with you, my f- focus is to make Dan Krikorian the greatest ever. But just to make the band uh, be part of the band. I mean, as a band, you you know, you're not trying to outshine anybody. You're trying to make the whole, you're trying to appeal to the audience. Right. And that's the whole key is to make, if the audience is happy, then, you know, we're happy. Um, yeah. But it's, you know, it's, a, and, and obviously it's the same way with a, with a single, uh, being a solo artist. But, uh, you know, playing with you, it's, it's important that, you know, I don't, overplay and just try to do some harmonies as much as possible to cover whatever you're doing so that I can <laughs> yeah. right no just try to just making you sound good that's that's the whole point it's yeah make, make you sound good and well you, well you do um <laughs> the whole the whole band does uh, no seriously yeah. um yeah we got some great players yeah the bands I don't know why you guys stick around with me all these guys we're we're wondering yeah. Yeah. We talk behind your back when you're not there. Do you? Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. It's it must be the money. It's the money. <laughs> the big money. <laughs> um and but seriously the band, I mean everybody's kind of a, a just a giant in their own instrument. It's just so fun, I think. Um and the reason I ask you that question is because for me there's times where I truly just enjoy going out and playing a song solo by myself because there's an intimacy about it or you know when you and I will go and do a show and a a duo and there's intimacy in that but then sometimes it's just really fun oh yeah to have a full band that's just kicking and uh, yeah it's it is it's a it's a hoot and we had some great gigs this 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 past summer summer. yeah yeah Yeah. and I, I don't know which one I prefer. I think it just depends on the show and the venue. You know, there's certain yeah. songs that lend themselves better to the band and yeah. things like that. But, um, I have to give you credit on this new record. I think I don't, I don't have a favorite song cause I just think it's impossible to have a favorite song. But one of the songs that surprised me by how much I was excited by it was, immensely aided by a suggestion from you you and i were driving up to i believe do some backing vocals one night uh, to the studio in la heading up to sean's heading up to see sean yeah. uh, shout out to sean norse sean Norris. and um i had 90 percent of the mixes done and i was kind of showing you and we were talking about the songs and then the song joe purdy came on and Joe Purdy is a song that's on the new record, but it's also on my fourth record, Bloom. But I redid it for this one, completely different vibe. Mm-hmm. And you listened to it and you thought for a second, you said, you know what would be really good on this song? A saxophone. A saxophone. And I thought, yeah. this guy's nuts. Yeah. I've never had a saxophone. <laughs> On any of my songs, it's about dang time. I don't know a saxophone player, <laughs> and and I remember you said it, and like we went to the studio that night, and I thought about it, and I started listening to some Bruce Springsteen songs that you know, Clarence has that saxophone, and then um, and eventually talked to Sean, and Sean um, knew a guy who um, Ron who came up and did it, 
and he just killed it. I mean, he like mm-hmm. he 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 did a great job on that song. Also, high heels. He played the saxophone. Yeah, but it would not be the same song without your suggestion. So I have to give you well hey, credit for that. Yeah, uh, I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, sometimes it doesn't hurt to listen to somebody. Well, that's, still got some of his teeth. Yeah, <laughs> right. That's what I've. I think. I think what I want to come across to the listeners of this podcast is, uh, you know, if you, if you look at the record and you know you're on a few songs as on this record at least um, doing some background vocals, but you're a full time mm-hmm. member of my uh, live band and you've been on other records, but um, just just your opinion, your voice, it, it's. It's hard to to explain with you know guys like you and guys like Sean or Bob Boulding, people that have been around um, for all my stuff, really shaping those songs. And so, you know, somewhere deep in your mind, you had a, a saxophone sound that it just happened to just it just it, it screamed saxophone. <laughs> <laughs> and so maybe maybe on this podcast I'll play a little bit of it so people know what I'm talking about. Yeah, or they could buy the record. Or that, you could buy the record. That, that's, that's right. Another that's right. Or you don't have to buy it and you can listen on Spotify. Well, you never know, Dan. I could come up with oboe in the next. <laughs> right. Time. Well, you never know. <laughs> well, your other talent <laughs> is your fantastic whistler. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you have on our song Fixed on You, you whistle. <laughs> Did the and, whistle. And that's always a, a fan favorite. Um, what's one of the, the best investments you feel you've made in your career? Besides playing with you. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, are you talking like um, equipment wise or just, uh, well, you know, you know, I'll give I, you an example. Yeah. Um, other guests have, have kind of asked that same clarifying question and yeah. I leave it sort of open ended on purpose, but yeah. it can be a piece of equipment. Some people have talked about something they've bought that's like been a great piece of equipment or right. whatever and then also something maybe personal as well so whatever yeah. well you know i think uh investing in um learning uh from other people and getting to know other artists or just people in general um you can learn so much from them um, I said, I, you know, some of these kids that I'm seeing at some of these open mics and stuff. Wow. I mean, uh, and just to think that, you know, it's like, wow, how can I get some of that? You know, that's really good stuff. And, uh, but investing just in the time and, uh, to learn and practice taking the time to do that, you know, obviously good equipment doesn't hurt. You know, when it comes to guitars, you know, if you're going to learn guitar, get a decent guitar. Mm-hmm. You know, don't get something junky because then you're going to get frustrated um, or whatever instrument you're you're doing. But uh, take the time and then, man, get lessons, uh, unlike myself. I mean, if you want to sit around and, and play, there are some people that, you know, they've come up, no lessons or whatnot. But everybody's had some kind of a lesson. I mean, I had something in high school. I took some guitar lessons or whatnot. But, um. Just continue learning, really. I mean, in this day and age with all the YouTube and stuff, and there's, yeah. there's no reason somebody can't learn how to play, sure. you know, three chords. And, uh, you know, so, yeah. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. I know earlier on you weren't a huge fan of my first guitar that I bought, and we're... I, and we're always it was fine it was fine <laughs> right and we're always <laughs> pushing me to upgrade get something as we as yes. we as we progress as a band yeah, you, yeah. so the um, getting a good instrument you're right and uh, yeah. the one I got now I love I think it yeah. sounds great it plays play, and they play easy yeah and if it plays easy then you, yeah. know, you can write better yep and so it makes a big difference and I just need to get you a guild yeah yeah that's your next step yeah yeah. Christmas around the corner. You yeah. get that for me if you want. Yeah, yeah I'll get you one of those. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> hey, is, is there is there a book or books that have stuck with you over the years as ones that? Wow. Oh man, I, I uh, you know. I am not a big reader. Okay. I I'm a big big reader. I don't. Um, if I do, it's going to be something 
usually nonfiction. I don't do a lot of fiction because I'm I want to learn something. Um, uh, I do have uh, I enjoy theology books, um, which you know may sound funny, but I do. Um, sometimes the um, you know besides the Bible, that's definitely a big mm-hmm. influence. But uh, I'm trying to think of a book that really I you know just not. I'm not a reader. I just do crosswords. <laughs> <laughs> That's where I get all my words. <laughs> I'm more of a, a, a visual, yeah, audio kind of yeah. person learner. Uh-huh. And uh, although I am one of these people that when, when my dad was uh, putting things together when I was a kid, he didn't look at directions. You know, okay. Like, you know, so, but, and so it really made me read directions. So I am very good at putting anything Ikea together. Yeah, I'll, I'll put it together, uh-huh. yeah, but I look at the directions and it's done the first time right. You don't have to take it apart again. Yeah. Yeah. So it may take a little longer. This whole room you're looking at, this whole studio. It's, uh, is Ikea. Is Ikea. Yeah. By yours truly. Yeah. <laughs> you two, did a two, fine job. Two straight days. Oh, you're missing a screw. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'm no, sorry. <laughs> no, there's no screw. I, uh, <laughs> it took two days and a lot of... Um, Allen wrenches. Allen wrenches yeah. and, and um, some curse words here and there. Yeah. Uh, some swearing. I'd never buy never. IKEA furniture again. No, I think IKEA means something in Swedish. <laughs> yeah, that nobody should. But repeat. it's standing. <laughs> it's holding, holding this table. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, Mike, this has been this has been really great. Um, kind of hearing about you know your past and coming up and what you have done as, in your career. Um, before we go, though, can you tell? listeners where they can find your music and kind of direct them to your yes. sites. Uh, it, Mike Teague music.com. That's Teague like league, but with a T mm-hmm. that's how I have to say it. Uh, and you know, I'm on iTunes and Amazon and Spotify, Mike Teague music now on uh, Instagram and Facebook, Mike Teague music. And, um, and the name of the record is Waterfall. Yeah, it's um, it's fun. The first song my daughter and I co-wrote, which is fun. And then mm-hmm. as mentioned before, David Starr and I co-wrote one song. And then I have a a little a one little ukulele instrumental at the end. I dedicated to uh, in memory of my mother-in-law, who had passed away uh, the year before uh, we did the album. So um, anyway, it's. It's nice. I appreciate it. If you want to go to and yeah. download them, great. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll make sure I have links to all of your stuff on uh, on my site when we post the yeah. podcast. So you guys can head over to dankrecording.com and find all of Mike's music as well as this podcast. And so, well, Mike, for doing this podcast, I thank you for the coconut porter beer. I, You're welcome. I really thank you. Yeah. And for all of the countless hours and time and energy you've put into helping my career, I, I can't thank you enough. So thank you so much. And been a uh, pleasure. It's been fun. The first, the first live podcast interview. First live. Yeah. This is uh we did pretty good. We did. Yeah. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks Mike. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much for tuning in to this really fun edition of the Beautiful Work Podcast. Today's guest was Mike Teague. Please make sure to follow Mike Teague and check out his music on his website, MikeTeagueMusic.com. That's Teague, like league with a T. Mike's latest album is Waterfall, and that is available on iTunes and everywhere that albums are sold, so please make sure to check out his music. For the podcast, dankrikorian.com, iTunes, please follow along and share. Always appreciate it. And consider signing up for our newsletter uh, on the website as well. The background music for the podcast today, the one behind us right now is Lila, and the one on the interlude is called Words. Both of these songs are on my new record, Grandeur, which is released on January the 18th. And before we close, as always, whatever you're doing, wherever you are, keep making 
that beautiful work. We'll see you next time.